ladies and gentlemen, Pam, glad to meet you. This is a dear friend, um, Dick Peterson from the Kingsman, Mr. Louie Louie himself. Say hi, Dick. Hello. Thank you for a third career. <laughs> um, I wanted to introduce him first, and I, my husband and Claudia Allen Peters were supposed to be up here because um, they deserve this honor as well. Oh, there you are. But uh, I'm really emotional. I haven't been in this theater since I was a little girl up there watching movies. I used to get grounded for sneaking off and watching movies all the time. And I never in a million years would dream I would have had a career in film, ever. And this is really huge. This is a big deal. But I want to start tonight by doing an acknowledgment of Indian land. I spent uh, time, my formative years in Tilakan, and I uh, wanted to acknowledge that this is Klamath, Modoc, Yurok land, and that I feel so blessed to be having grown up in God's country. I love this place very, very much. But because my mom moved me away from Klamath during some rough years here in Klamath Falls, I was 16. Um, uh, because uh, my mom moved us to where her 1870 family farm was up in Eugene, outside of Eugene. I got to go to South Eugene, and I got to meet this incredible man. Ladies and gentlemen, Philip Creasel, would you please stand up? He's the godfather of Oregon film. And I would also like to introduce Claudia Allen Peters, who without you, Otis wouldn't be here, Dick wouldn't be here. Please stand up. She's my, I call her my fairy godmother. But um, growing up in Klamath Falls, my, my dad was friends with James Ivory. There's something about this place. There's something about this place. And I wouldn't change anything for the world, not even the really hard years in Chiloquin during the termination or in Klamath with Sheriff Red Britain. You know what I mean? Um, because this place inspired us artists. This theater, this theater made me who I am today. With movies, I could, I could imagine all sorts of worlds, and I got to grow up. I spent 26 years trying to get a screenplay made about Jackson Sundown and his first man, Chief Joseph's nephew, but Hollywood just wasn't quite ready for a story through Indian eyes. But now that's changing. And I'm on an MTV film that's coming up to Oregon Indian Country. I'm working with a BBC filmmaker, a showrunner, that's coming to Oregon Indian Country. And the biggest, most wonderful thing of my life was to come full circle and to work with Chamawa indigenous students in documentary filmmaking, and I want to bring them back here next year for your incredible film festival. Nobody else is doing what you're doing. And so, Kurt, I want to thank you for creating this amazing Klamath Independent Film Festival. Big kudos to you. So we got Otis on the plane at 10 a.m. from Las Vegas. We got Otis on the plane from what was it, LAX, to Medford. Lord knows where Otis is, but I know that I've got a steak waiting for him, and he'll be here really soon. <laughs> so he will be back for the 9 o'clock, and some of the people that I cast in Animal House will be Zooming in, including Niedermeyer. Can I get a hell yeah? Now drop and give me 20, Dick. Uh, I, I couldn't give you three. <laughs> So why don't you say a few words about this incredible legacy that we've inherited? Well, oh, I am on. Hello. 
I can only tell you this. The Kingsmen started with records in 1964, and Louis Louis became a giant hit in 1965. We worked every day except for 13 days during Christmas that we took off. <clears throat> the crazy thing was sometimes we would do, do double days, and we played all of our concerts were three or four hours long. We did this for five years straight, and then psychedelic music hit. And people really didn't want to hear what we were doing any longer, and we weren't into the drugs and the weird stuff on screens. <laughs> and we just became has overnight. <laughs> you know, we became this giant hit thing overnight, and then it just stops. So we all took on other careers. We played local clubs. We did things that musicians do, and all of a sudden, Animal House came out. Thanks to <clears throat> Animal House came out and gave us a second career, and we're still riding that career. We still play concerts. We go all over the United States. We don't play four hours a night any longer, <laughs> but um, we still do perform. We have a blast together, and Animal House just changed all of our lives. It was a great ride before Animal House, but after Animal House, we see all these people in togas, and please don't throw food. <laughs> But it's really been quite a ride. And plus, we got to meet people like this lovely person right here. <clears throat> She's very special. And I'm glad you're honoring her tonight. This is outrageous. I think we ought to come back next year. Yes. Yeah? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. And Tim Matheson, who played Otter, wanted to be here. But he's shooting nights up in Vancouver. Couldn't make it. Uh, Mary Louise Weller, who played Mandy, sends her love to all of you. I know that um, we called him Blue She. I know that he's looking down from heaven. Just so proud of this Klamath Independent Film Festival for honoring this us little people, this behind the scenes people. But one of the most beautiful things, Dick, that Animal House gave me was the Kingsman in my life oh. and Mike Mitchell. Yeah, Mike. Mike Mitchell, the lead guitarist, and helped me mentor a Portland street punk band. We took him off the street of southeast Portland. We put him in a studio, and they wrote the soundtrack to Animal House of Blues. And you got to see them doing Louie Louie with Mike Mitchell at the end of the film. Mm -hmm. And Mike, Mike was a very special person. Um, he was our lead guitar player. He actually started the Kingsman in 1956. He named the Kingsman, although instead of it being King's men, like he found on his father's aftershave, <laughs> he made it one word, the Kingsman, but that's where he got the name. And he was one of the most beautiful people. Oh, my gosh. A, a kinder heart was never created, and he is dearly missed, and I know he's with you all the time. Yeah. That you were dear friends. He really, he really cared for you. And he loved you too. Be and better. And he loved Claudia, and he loved Philip, and he sure loved those street punkers up in Portland. So that is my thing. My thing. Somebody put a camera in my hands when I was 18 years old. I couldn't. I was dyslexic. I had attention deficit disorder. I had alexithymia. And. I couldn't really talk, read, spell, and I was an English major. <laughs> but I was an English major because I was a poet. And Sherman Alexi was inspired by another Indian named Ed Edmo. And Ed Edmo was just like me. And I started finding people that were just like me who were very visual people and who could tell stories with pictures. And that saved my life as an 18-year-old girl lost at the University of Oregon. And it was a bunch of wild and crazy guys on a bus. If you saw Animal House Blues, you saw who I'm talking about. And they were serious filmmakers, serious 16-millimeter poets. And that's what I want to do. I want to help, help the kids at Chamal. I want to help save their life, too by telling our stories. We all need to tell our stories. So Animal House was actually 
inspired by Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters, going back east. And Chris Miller, the lead writer, wrote a story called Night of the Seven Fires about a frat house. But when he saw them and read about the Merry Pranksters going back east with this camera, who are wild and crazy guys, they decided to make a movie, and it ended up being Animal House. So I just want you to know, Animal House was inspired by Oregonians, and who could have ever thought this film shot anywhere else? Can any of you imagine it anywhere else but in Oregon? So I'm damn proud of this movie, and I sure love all of you for being here tonight. I am so honored here. I had to go in the girls' room and just cry my eyes out, stepping back into this theater in the town of my birth. It was such a wonderful thing. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to turn it back over to Kurt. And Otis and I and Dick will be back at 9 o'clock for the Q&A, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, Catherine, um, could you talk maybe a bit about some of your other film experiences that you've had throughout 50 plus years of working in the film industry? Well, that's why I wanted you to buy my damn book. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to leak it. <laughs> but um, so Animal House was um, a B drive in movie, had no budget got turned down. Kurt filled me in. I thought it was like six or seven Ivy League schools back in. It was 40 universities said no. Universal was going to pull the plug after Labor Day weekend in September of 1977. And I get a call from this guy named Peter McGregor Scott, who was a UPM guy, unit production manager, that I'd done some scouting for for free. Back when we were trying to form the film office, we all worked for free. And he called me and said, didn't I see an Ivy Lake school there? And I said, yeah. He goes, we need 26 locations in four hours. Universal's going to pull the plug on this little nothing of a movie if we can't get a location by Monday morning, which is a holiday weekend. So this little band of Merry Pranksters took out the eclairs and the Bolexes and the 16 millimeter, and we went out and we shot real film of all these locations. And we get a call and they go, oh my God, we're on. So it was a bunch of wild and crazy people that saved the day, that saved Animal House. How apropos, right? And... Um, they flew up, and we were really high styling. Bob Laird, um, who's still my partner to this day, and Mike Hagen, an original Mary Prankster, um, went out to the airport, picked them up with a car that had one shock missing. So director John Lannis and Ivan Reitman get in the back and <laughs> slide over to the side. <laughs> so, you know, we were really styling. <laughs> And uh, they go, we have to show the studio. We have one more location, Catherine. And we're, we're really scared to go back and say that we don't have this because it was very racially sensitive. Can you guess what location? The Dexter Lake Club. I said, okay, guys, you know, I'm going to take you to the airport in the morning. My VW bug that had all four shocks. So... I, went, I had a dream that night, and my friend Deborah here, we know the power of dreams. I had a dream, and a voice whispered, you've gone by that place your whole childhood, from Klamath Falls to Eugene, is a little roadhouse in Dexter, somewhere on Highway 58. Didn't say Dexter. And... So when they got in the car that morning, I said, okay, guys, let's, uh, let's see what we can find. I had a dream about this place last night. 
Well, if you said that to a UPM nowadays, they'd think you were crazy and commit you. But, you know, that was 70s. And they went, let's go for it. We've got nothing left for you to lose. I got lost in Jasper. I kind of knew the area in my dream. And we came across the bridge, and there it was, Dexter. And John Landis, Ivan Reitman, and the art director, um, John, I can't remember his last name now, got out of my VW bug and jumped up and down, grabbed my hand in a circle going, this is it, this is it, this is it. We went inside. It couldn't have been better. It had zero wallpaper. It had, but you saw that in my documentary. But after... You know, everybody thinks Animal House was my big film. Somehow I ended up on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, too. And that was because the film commissioner for the state of Oregon, named by Governor Tom McCall, walked onto the set of the Insane Asylum of Oregon State. It was called Insane Asylum. And said... I think Jack Nicholson's smoking pot in here. Well, he got 86 because if you'd been in that place, you would never, ever do any kind of drugs. It already looked like an acid trip. <laughs> I mean, the walls had like 100 years of Lysol oozing through the paint, and the walls were kind of running down on the floor. And guess who were the extras? Yep, they hired the real thing. So I got a call from the governor saying, I need a new, I need eyes and ears on the set of this thing. And I showed up and fell mad in love with Milos Foreman and Jack and Michael. And you know, we're, we're still friends to this day. I used to stay at Jack Nicholson's house in the Art Garfunkel room which is really his daughter Jennifer's room. And I loved his daughter. And that was a great film. And Stand By Me was another one I was so blessed to work on. And I was a den mother to those full four boys in the Hilton Hotel because they had no moms there. And uh, they needed one. So I'm just so blessed for the career I've had. And then... After Stand By Me, I met Philip, and I wanted to stay home and write. I wanted to be a writer, and he went to work in Portland and commuted for 26 years from the Mackenzie River to Portland to work in film so I could stay home and be a writer. And he's wearing his grim t-shirt tonight. He worked with Tommy Lee Jones. He worked with some of the really greats. It has some great stories that are in my book, too, about Tommy Lee trying to kill the screenplay writer one night. So there's some great stories in there. And uh, yeah, I'd be really honored if you could pick up my books. I'm really proud of them. And one of them, a U of O professor, asked me, two U of O professors asked me to write about what was in the Kool-Aid. What created James Ivory? What created our generation? What created the new Hollywood? And I think you'll be surprised about the answer. It wasn't Kool-Aid. It was a spiritual emanation that has a great sense of humor. So I love all of you, and I'm so grateful to be here. And we'll see you again at 9 o'clock, OK? OK. It'll be OK. Catherine, and thank you, Dick, very much for that. So here's the plan. We are about to watch the greatest comedy film ever made. Shot in Eugene, Oregon, in Cottage Grove. A film that inspired a hundred other films to follow thereafter. I mean, think of all of the college hijinks, teen hijinks films that, that came out in the 80s, and still to this day, all the, anima, the American Pie films and whatnot would not exist had Animal House not come along. 
There is, of course, an iconic scene, and I am so thankful that some of you came out clad in togas tonight, appropriately dressed. I, I, I tried to, uh, to also do my part of dressing as Belushi tonight. Uh, the song Shout has taken on a special meaning, not just with how iconic this film has become, but hey, we're in Oregon. Anyone who's a University of Oregon fan that's been to a football or basketball game has sung along to Shout between the third and fourth quarters. We're gonna do that tonight too. So when we start the film, we're gonna pause the film when it gets to the iconic fraternity party scene. Everyone in a toga or a costume, or if you're just really in the spirit, come up on stage. We're gonna dance along to it. And we have a very, very special mystery prize that will be judged by Dick and hopefully also by Otis whenever he wants to show up. Uh, that will be going to one uh, specially costumed person. Also, Catherine did not mention it. She did mention that her books are in the lobby. Go pick that up. But she also donated to us an actual piece of the Delta House. It was torn down in the 1980s. She salvaged a piece of the house, and it is on display in the lobby. We are auctioning that off tonight. This may be the last time in history that a piece of the Delta House is available to go to anyone in the public. So if you are interested in having your very own piece of the animal house that you can show off to all of your friends that come by, there is an auction list inside there and at some point tonight when, when we're done. So when we're done with the film too, we have a series of actors, or at least one is here with us and several will also be joining us via Zoom to talk to us as well. With that, I think we should see the greatest Oregon comedy and the greatest college comedy film ever made. Here is National Lampoon's Animal. 